Hello and welcome to the next in our webinar series. Um, this webinar is one of two that is organized by Plant Physiology to celebrate uh, the October focus issue on circadian rhythms. Today we have three speakers, Lee Wang, Kathleen Greenham, Glenn Urig. Uh, our moderator is Ava Herrera Serrano and our host is Stacy Harmer. Um, as I mentioned, this is the focus issue on circadian rhythms. It's the October 2022 issue of Plant Fizz. It's edited by Stacy Harmer, Alex Webb, and Christian Bankhauser, and it is online now. Uh, this recording will be posted to YouTube, and you will find other recordings available on, on that website. Many great science talks on the Plante YouTube channel. We'd like to make a special thank you to the ASPB members. The, this webinar series is sponsored by the American Society of Plant Biologists. And if you would be interested in membership, if you use the code PRESENTS10, you can get 10% off your membership dues. If you have any problems, please email me, Mary Williams, mwilliams at ASPB.org. If you have uh, questions for the speakers, we encourage you to put them in the Q&A box. And with this, I will turn this over to Stacy. Thank you. Oops, hold on. Stop sharing my screen. Oh, sorry, the transcript's in the way. There we go. Okay, there you go. Stacy, over to you. Okay, thank you so much for the introduction, Mary. And thanks to everybody for tuning in. I'm really excited that uh, I get to share this highlights of this focus issue with you. And let me make it so I can see my screen. There we go. All right. So, yeah. So we have this focus issue on circadian rhythms, and I'm just excited to give you a little bit of an overview of the topic and the the um, papers in the issue. So you know probably circadian rhythms are obvious in yourself. You have rhythms in your sleep and wake cycle. You see rhythms in animals around you, but you also see rhythms in plants. And this is a movie from Plants in Motion website, which I highly recommend to all of you, showing a 24 hour rhythm in a plant, which is leaf movement rhythms. And even though this is plants in constant light and temperature, it's showing these 24 hour rhythms. And in fact, this was the first circadian rhythm that people observed that was in plants. And in the hundreds of years since that first recorded observation, people have been fascinated by understanding what's going on with this circadian clock, this internal timer. And we know a lot now about the organization of the circadian system in plants and in animals. And this general overview holds for all um, organisms that have been studied, that there's a circadian oscillator. It's a cell autonomous clock running within the nuclei of these cells. It generates rhythmic outputs like leaf movements. And these are rhythms in transcription physiology, biochemistry, but a clock that couldn't be readjusted is not very useful. So it can be reset by environmental cues such as light and temperature, and that's called entrainment. So this looks pretty straightforward, but in fact, things are much more complicated than that. And in fact, the circadian oscillator itself can influence output pathways and pathways that reset the clock. And these are called gating, this phenomenon. And this is an important concept for uh, today's talks and also for the issue uh, articles in the issue. So let me give you a brief example of gating. So here we have, let's imagine we have a plant that's in constant darkness. Let's say you give it a light pulse in the subjective morning. That's a time when plants are highly sensitive to light and you would get a strong response. But if you took an identical plant and gave it an identical stimulus, but at a later time of day, so late in the, say in the evening, the gate would be closed and that same response would give you a weak response to light. So that's an example of how time of day can give you a, a completely different magnitude response because of the functional clock. So that's called gating. All right, so this, um, as I mentioned, this general scheme holds true for all the model organisms that have been studied. What do we know about the clock, the oscillator itself in plants? So work from many labs over a few decades now has led to a very complicated model. And um, in fact, this is just a subset of clock genes that have been identified. And these are, I'm showing here a bunch of plant-specific transcription factors 
that are controlling each other's expression, turning each other's expression on and off in this complicated web. And this is uh, what, what makes up the oscillator itself. And for most of the today's talks, we don't really need to think too much about this. So we'll, we'll go back to the schematic diagram. All right, so I wanna highlight the, the articles in the focus issue. We have a few focused on evolution of the circadian system. So there's a really nice update from the MITOG lab looking at the evolution of clocks in plants along the green lineage. And there's a article from Todd Michael, a research report where he demonstrates that some of the circadian, circadian clock genes that I showed you in that clock diagram have gotten into close genetic linkage and that's conserved over the green lineage. And as an aside, Todd contributed that lovely cover art that you saw in the first slide that I showed. Uh, another interesting question is how these cell autonomous clocks are coordinated across the body of the plant. And there's a, an article, a research update from the labs of uh, Matomu Endo and James Locke looking at um, reviewing what we know about coordination of the clock across the plant. Another really important topic that we are gaining a lot of insight into is how environmental inputs entrain the oscillator. And there is an update article from Alex Webb on entrainment and a research article from the lab of Seth Davis looking at how light affects the localization of a clock component called early flowering three. Well, of course, what most of us care about most is how plants use their circadian systems. And so we have an update article from Nakamichi lab that really beautifully um, discusses how the clock and clock components adapt plant flowering time to different locations and how this is important for crop species. And Katie Greenham has a, a lovely update looking at the adaptive nature of the plant clock in natural environments. And finally, there's a, a tool reported from Don Nagel's group that is, I think many people will find quite useful. It's an application that allows you to really easily access the bioinformatic data, um, visualizing circadian and heat stress responsive genes in, in a variety of plant species. So I invite you to check that out. Other um, articles in the issue focus more on some of the clock components. And here in this view, I've highlighted uh, these pink genes here. So these dark pink genes are called reveles. These are mid-like transcription factors, intrinsic components of the core oscillator. And these lighter pink genes, CC1 and LHY, are also core intrinsic components of the oscillator. All of these are mid-like transcription factors they have very similar DNA binding domains. And in fact, they bind to the same cis elements. This is important because they have, they share some targets. For example, CC1 and LHY are primarily repressors of core clock genes, here shown in blue, whereas the Reveles are activators of those core clock genes. So they act in opposition within the circadian network. And we have two research articles that look at these mid factors. From Li Wang, we, he discusses how rice CCA1 is involved in regulating ABA signaling and the implications for plant stress tolerance. And from Glenn Urig, we have a, a nice multi-omic analysis showing how the Reveille genes are not only clock factors, but also how they regulate fundamental aspects of plant physiology, particular carbohydrate metabolism and proteasome function. So um, with that, I'll wrap up and I'll turn things over to Ava Herrera Serrano, who's going to be the moderator for this session. So she is a, in Alex Webb's group where she's studying the function of some WD-40 repeat proteins within the plant clock. And previously she worked with Seth Davis to understand the function of the evening complex components. So with that, I will stop sharing and turn things over to Ava. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stacy. Um, so I'm going to go in directly into the webinar and I will uh, present the first speaker, Li Wang. Um, Li Wang is a professor at the Key Laboratory of Molecular Plant Physiology in the Institute of Botany and the Chinese Academy of Science. He received his PhD in 2006 and uh, he was a postdoctoral researcher uh, in David Sommer's lab, where he uh, worked in the biochemical and molecular mechanisms of the plant circadian clock. 
and currently his research uh, focuses on characterizing novel circadian clock components, both in rice and in Arabidopsis, and investigating the post-translational modifications of these components, and also uh, the molecular networks that are regulating the outputs of the clock. So, Guy, um, whenever you're ready. Okay, so can you hear me? So uh, thanks, first of all, thank uh, Dr. V Mary Williams for organizing this webinar. Thanks Stacy Hammer for hosting this uh, nice seminar. So today I'm going to show, to share one of our recent papers uh, published in Plant Physiology about uh, um, the rice circadian clock associated with one comfort multiple abiotic stress tolerance by ultra stretching ABS signaling. So as uh, Stacy Hammer already gave us a very uh, nice introduction about how circadian clock works. So as we know, circadian clock is an endogenous timekeeping mechanism that controls and optimizes biological process to make the endogenous organism rhythms to fit the deal rhythm of light and temperature in the environment. So that's to uh, ensure the plant grow uh, in the time, in the very, very uh, good uh, advantage. So one uh, simplified uh, components of a plant skin cloud can be classified into three parts. One we call the inputs, uh, then these core oscillator and outputs. In the core oscillators is majorly, uh, is composed by uh, a few transcription, translational feedback loops. One of the feedback loops we call circadian associated one, a second clock associated one, that's mean CCA1, and it's family members HY. This one is essential in the morning phase genes. It will repress other clock members like PR proteins and the evening complex proteins, expressions. So that's to form a feedback loop. So uh, they already have a few uh, papers published in crops. So we know now we not only focus on Arabidopsis, we're also using uh, the crops to as the materials to investigate the clock rules. So you can see in rice, barley, uh, wheat, and soybean, many of the clock components play fundamental rules, especially in flowering time control. So also in regional adaptation. So a few control also shown uh, clock component may be involved in the abiotic stress uh, tolerance like automatic stress, uh, Gigantia. Uh, today, I want to focus one of the clock components we call OSCCA1. Actually, OSCCA1 was reported to show regular tiller growth and a pinnacle development. As you can see here, uh, both two alleles, the now mutant CCA1 alleles, display much more tiller numbers. Then later on, they found actually CC1 can affect strike electronic sig signaling, thus affecting the theory number. Also, uh, in addition, CC1 was shown to balance rice heading date and uh, nitrogen use efficiency. In this uh, intricate uh, the mechanism is shown, the OSCC1, they also called NHD1, whatever, they can promote. HD3A expression. HD3A is the flow region in rice. And also it can repress another gene we call FDGOGAT. This one is essential component for nitrogen use efficiency. Thus, CCA1 can balance the heading date and nitrogen use efficiency. But, no, but we don't know whether and how clock components uh, CCA1 regulate the biotic stress in rice. So to test this, we firstly, we generated the, the CC1 now mutants by using CRISPR-Cas9 approach. Um, luckily, we get two uh, independent alleles. One allele we call a CC1 L1. Uh, this one contains one in, uh, inserted one nucleotide. Another allele was contain two uh, nucleotide deletions, so both two alleles resulted in 
very truncated proteins. So that we call actually uh, is a non-functional uh, poly peptides. So let, then we check the, whether this one, uh, this uh, mutant uh, is uh, involved in abiotic stress. As you can see here, when we treated the, the plants using 180 millimole uh, sodium chloride for 24 days, then for, uh, followed by 10 days recovery. As you can see here, one type can recover very well, but both alleles cannot recover uh, that much. So this survival rate clearly shown the CC1 non mutants are more sensitive to substrate, in indicating CC1 is a positive regulate for the substrate. Inconsistently, uh, we found in the iron leakage and MDA content in CC1 mutant is higher than the Y type. This consists with uh, is more sensitive to substrate. We also shown um, Using the DAB study, you can see this one. Can, DAB study is an indicator of the raw homeostasis. We can find in the presence of the sodium chloride. In the CC1, both of the mutants, they show much higher accumulated ROS. So this uh, consists with CC1 is sensitive to substrates. In addition, we found the CC1 mutants are also sensitive to uh, osmotic stress and drought stress. We treated this one using uh, many manito and this uh, uh, using drought stress. As you see in here, both Leo displayed much uh, less survival rate compared to the wild type. They're suggesting OSC is one in, is involved into multiple uh, particle stress tolerance. So as we know, uh, OSC one is a uh, transcription factor. So we checked uh, this nuclear localization. As we can see here, both, all of our proteins predominantly localized in the nucleus. These free JIP can localize both in the cytosol and nucleus. So then we ask uh, one question. So whether the CC1 plays role in a body stress tolerance is through affecting the downstream gene expression. So to do this, we test the uh, Identify the bonding genes by OSCC1 using one the new technology called DNA affinity purification, uh, followed by sequence. Overall, we in total we get over uh, twelve thousand bonding peaks by OSCC1. But most of the bonding peaks were distributed in the promote or intergenic regions, only four percent, and uh, uh, 17% in the exon or in the, in the intron, respectively. This shown this day one majorly function as a transcription factor. Interestingly, we found the rice uh, CC1 binding sequence is slightly different from the Arbidopsis CC1, but quite similar. To test whether the CC1 can really bind in the CBS sequence, we Perform the MSR assay. As you can see in here, in all these uh, CBS sequences, uh, CC1 can bind them very well. But once in the presence of a competitor, all the bonding was gone. So this suggesting CC1 can specifically bind in all these CBS sites. So we also perform the KGG analysis to. Uh, to check which uh, class of the was enriched among the OSCC1 bonding genes. We show, this one shown from the hormone signaling transduction um, cluster, and another one is circadian rhythm. This consists, this is in well line with uh, OSCC1, it's a circadian clock components. So next, as, we, as you know, if we want to identify the direct transcription targets, we also needed to know which genes was differentially expressed in the OSCC1 mutants. Thus, we performed iron sequence uh, in the presence of the salt stress. Overall, we got uh, over 800 genes were upregulated in OSCC1 mutants, and uh, downward genes about 900. Among those different uh, DGs, you can see 
one of a class, uh, the class that called response to ABA signaling was enriched when we using the gene ontology analysis. This suggesting OSCS1 probably involved in ABA signaling. When we compare the our OSCS1 type sequence data and R sequence data, we found over about 692 direct targets. Interestingly, among these uh, 692 genes, about 300 genes was upregulated, and about half was downregulated. Uh, about in, among the, all these, the uh, one of class A OSPP2C genes were downregulated in OSCC1. So this suggesting CC1 probably function as a trans transcription activator for them. We also compared our the bound genes and downregulated genes with the salt response genes. We found that one of OSP46, this gene previ previously was shown to function in IBS signaling in rice. So now we, uh, we check whether OSCS1 can really bind in PB2C and OSBC promoters. So we choose their bonding size, the potential bonding size uh, within the, their promoters respectively. We found actually OSPP 10A cannot uh, can bond in, uh, in M site one, but M site two, you can see here, all of them was gone. So this suggesting um, this bonding site two is real, is real bonding site of OSCC1. And also, OSCC1 combining OSBC promoter in our MSR assay. Next, we checked whether the uh, OSCC1 can affect the, these two genes expression. Then we using we isolated the, the rice protoplast that we put. Then we transfected all these uh, effector and reporters. As you can see here, we tagged the, the OSCC1 either with the VP16, this uh, uh, activation tag, and also with another one we call SRDX. This one is a repressor. So, but you can see here, OSCC1 can promote uh, OSPP 108 expression and similar like VP16. But SRDS cannot repress this one. Similarly, uh, OSCC1 also can promote uh, OSPC46 uh, expression. So this suggesting uh, OSCC1 can really affect uh, OSPP 108 and OSBC46, the two components in IBS signaling. Uh, so that may affect in ABA signaling. So then we check whether is this real. So we take the OSCC1 mutants, treated using the ABA signaling, uh, using ABA hormone. As you can see in here, um, compared to the wild type, uh, all the plant height was extremely lower in the OSCC1 to alleles. So this suggesting OSCC1 is really hypersensitive to ABA treatment. When we're using higher com concentration of ABA and that will cause the cell death, uh, you can see here. But the wild type is still grow very well, but all the two, uh, both two mutants was already uh, uh, very, very extremely lower survival rate. This is further suggesting uh, OSCC1 is really uh, involved in ABS signaling. So thus we have a brief uh, conclusion. So OSCC1 mainly function as a circadian uh, cloud components as a harbor to repress, uh, to promote OSPC46 and OSPP108. Uh, in, in addition, OSPC46 is another, is also transcription factor. It will uh, affect the other genes expression, thus form a transcription cascade. So uh, briefly, uh, we, we, have, uh, so we have a few uh, messages shared for us. 
Once the uh, rice clock components OS61 is a portable regulate for multiple abiotic stress. And also our genome-wide identification of transcriptional targets of associated OS61 suggests is involved into the regulation of IVA signaling. And also OSPP2C members such as OSPP1A and OSPC46 are direct targets of OSC1 to mediate its regulation on ABS signaling and uh, abiotic stress adaptation. So I, uh, this is uh, our story. I want to stop here and uh, thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Lei. Um, now I will read some questions uh, from the chat. Okay. So, um, so the first question, uh, in Arabidopsis, we know that CCA1 is a transcriptional repressor, but you saw that in rice, it seems to be both, maybe working both as a repressor and activator. Do you know why that could, where that could be the difference? Uh, okay, uh, thanks for the question. As you can see here, actually, uh, we found the, among the, the 692 direct targets of OSCC1. About half of them were upregulated in OSCC1 mutants, but uh, the other half is downregulated. This suggesting probably OSCC1 can function um, either as a transcription repressor, but also it may function as trans transcription activator. I think probably this depends on uh, which kind of uh, complex it forms. It may form a transcription repressor with other, uh, other proteins. It may be also function as an activator by, form a, uh, by interaction with different proteins. That's from the two kind of a complex. One complex as activator, another complex as a repressor. I think this may be need to identify uh, OSCC1 interactomes in the future to clarify this question. Thanks. Thank you. And another question. Um, does natural variation in CC1 confer any advantage in terms of abiotic stress tolerance? So the... uh, excuse me, I, I cannot hear. Yes. So uh, is it now if natural variation in CC1 can confer uh, any any advantage in abiotic stress tolerance in rice or in, in other uh, plant species? Okay, actually, uh, I'm not sure what well, maybe in soybean, uh, CCA1, they call maybe RHY, uh, has been identified also um, play a role in ABS signaling in, in soybean. I think probably uh, for scaling clock, is kind of a, a general mechanism to regulate a, uh, hormone signaling like uh, ABA, and uh, probably other signaling like uh, SA and uh, just monit, uh, for example. And then that may confer uh, not only the abiotic stress, but also uh, the other defense like pathogen and insect. So probably this is a general mechanism. I think in the future, we need to uh, uh, to use this kind of a uh, fetch to develop uh, the super alleles OSCC1. Probably uh, the natural allele will be better uh, to uh, use for the breeding, for the design breeding in the future, I think. Okay. Thank you very much, Lei. Uh, we are going to move on to the next speaker in the interest of, okay. of time. Thank you, Eva. Thank you. Okay. Very much. Thank you. Um, so the the second speaker of today is Kathleen Greena. Uh, Kathleen joined the faculty of uh, in the department of plant microbial microbial biology at the University of Minnesota as an assistant professor in 2019. Um, she did a PhD in the University of California in San Diego, and her research focuses on um, investigating how internal timekeeping regulates plant fitness by coordinating physiological responses to environmental stresses. And her last, 
her lab applies computational approaches that integrate temporal and spatial resolved transcriptomics with uh, physiological and, metabolo and metabolic outputs in Arabidopsis and, and Brassica. And uh, so we're looking forward for your talk, Kathleen. Thank you. Thank you, Eva, for the introduction. Thank you, Mary, for organizing the webinar. And thank you to Stacy, Alex, and Christian for putting together such a fantastic focus issue. Uh, today, I'm going to talk to you about some of the work we're doing to understand how time of day informs transcriptional responses to abiotic stress uh, in Brassica. So um, I'm going to talk to you today about things on the daily scale, but it's important to remember that environmental conditions are set by the seasonal changes in photoperiod and temperature brought on by the rotation of the Earth. And this is something that we expand on in the review and our focus issue. And I'm just showing you here two examples at two different latitudinal zones to emphasize this where temperature we see throughout the year in the solid lines, and then photo period is in these hash lines here. And what you can see is that there's this natural temperature lag where the warmest part of the year comes after the longest day. And this is really important because plants are adapted to this lag. And with climate change, that lag is shrinking. So the warmest part of the year is happening earlier and earlier. So understanding how plants are responding to these cues is really critical if we wanna improve how they grow, for example, for crop productivity. Now, as Stacey and Leigh have already mentioned, how temperatures, how plants sense changes in temperature and photoperiod is due to the circadian clock, which is conserved across all kingdoms of life. In plants, it is really critical for coordinating internal processes with the external environment. And a really nice example, of course, is sensing changes in photoperiod to regulate flowering time, also regulating hormone signaling in response to biotic and abiotic stress, as we heard for just ABA signaling, changes in metabolism, and ultimately, uh, this is a way to maximize energy use efficiency throughout the day to maintain growth. Now, integral to the function of the clock, as we already heard, is the control of the transcriptome. And that's what we are really interested in, is uncovering what transcriptional regulation drives these certain outputs. So we think in terms of patterns, and whether that's at the level of the transcriptome, physiology, or metabolism, identifying patterns associated with our trait of interest, for example, abiotic stress tolerance, and then with the idea of applying genome editing approaches to move those patterns into our more sensitive lines. So I'm gonna to talk to you today with, about transcription, um, a little physiology, but we're also doing quite a bit in metabolomics that I won't have time to talk about. So in the lab, we work in Arabidopsis and Brassica. Brassica is a really fantastic crop system to work in. It's incredibly morphologically diverse. Uh, it's closely related to Arabidopsis. So it's a really nice system to um, study different phenotypes and physiological responses while leveraging what we know in Arabidopsis. It's also a great model for polyploidy and understanding how genome expansion has given rise to novel phenotypes. And this is due to a genome triplication event since diverging from Arabidopsis. So in Brassica rapa, which is what I'll be talking about today, every Arabidopsis ortholog could have up to three copies. So this leads to an interesting question of how the clock has contributed to this genome expansion and potentially new, new phenotypes and, and traits. Now we've heard about the clock um, network and what I wanna emphasize here, which is also covered in this focus issue is that the circadian clock is expanded across the green lineage from a very simple two component system in Austriacaucus shown here, where our day express genes are shown in yellow, our evening genes are in gray. And you can see as we move from moth to moss, Arabidopsis and Brassica, this clock network has expanded. So we have a much more complex network of transcriptional translational feedback loops. But what I wanna emphasize here is that in Brassica, we see that circadian clock genes have been preferentially retained in multiple copies, suggesting that they're functional and important for the, um, the plant, but also this sets up a stage where they could be um, Function, um, providing new function or neo-functionalizing. And that's what we were interested in examining. So with this expansion of the core clock, do we also see an expansion of the transcriptome that's regulated by the clock? So we performed a circadian time course experiment in this yellow sarsen variety R500, where we collected leaf tissue every two hours for 48 hours under circadian conditions. So this is under constant light and temperature where every rhythmic expression that we see is driven by the clock. And what we found is over 70% of genes were controlled by the clock. And this is just summarizing that in this heat map where you can see these waves of expression pattern throughout the day. So this is um, a lot more than what we see in Arabidopsis, suggesting that following this triplication event, we do see expansion of the circadian network. 
Now we wanted to know whether the genes that are in multiple copies have maintained similar expression pattern or is there evidence that they're diverging in their regulation and function? To do this, we needed a way to compare gene expression patterns. So rather than single time point differential expression analysis, how do we identify the pattern of a gene? So we came up with this package called DIPOM or differential pattern analysis by linear models. This is a published package. It's also available on CRAN. So I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but what DIPOM does is it leverages co-expression networks, which assigns, identifies all the expression profiles in your data set. We can correlate each gene's expression to those patterns and get a value that's representative of the pattern. And that we can input into a set of linear model contrasts so you can test how a gene's profile changes in response to a treatment or compared to its, its paralog. You can then take those genes and cluster them to identify genes with similar expression pattern change. So when we go back to that circadian data set and we take our set of expressed paralogs and we ask, do they change in expression pattern? We find that over 40% of those genes have diverged in expression pattern. And when we look at some of those clusters, here's two examples, it's quite striking. So in this case, we have 90 genes that show almost complete antiphase expression, where one copy shown in blue is expressed in the morning and the other copies at the end of the day. And then there are examples where we see several hours of change of phase. So this is a pretty um, widespread divergence of expression pattern and led us to wonder whether these paralogs are diverging also in function. So do they change in response to abiotic stress, for example? So to address this question, uh, we are leveraging a community science program grant from the JGI that has generated seven de novo genome assemblies for seven morphotypes of brassica, along with a transcriptome and metabolomics data set from this time course experiment we performed, where plants were grown under control conditions, some shifted into cold for three days, and then on the third day, we collected leaf tissue over 24 hours for RNA-seq and metabolomics. I'm only going to talk about the RNA-seq data today, and I'm going to focus on this yellow sarsen variety, which is what we performed that circadian experiment on. Now, with the goal to identify patterns associated with a tolerance trait, we, of course, need to know what the tolerances are of these genotypes. So this is work done by a former postdoc in the lab, Maddie Oravik, and two talented undergrads, Adelaide, Adelaide Hazen and Sydney Weinecke. And they designed a freeze tolerance assay that we could perform across all these diverse morphotypes without killing any of them so we could actually measure their tolerances. And this is kind of the design. So plants are, the free stress plants are brought to minus three at the end of the night and into the morning. And I just kind of emphasize this because this is when plants normally experience the coldest part of the day. So we tend to do our, our temperature treatments with cold at night. So here we tried to shift it to toward, sort of mimic those natural environments. So here's a few of the metrics we use. We measure a number of different physiological uh, measures. Um, here is photosystem two efficiency shown as Fe over Fm. And this is at single time point, but we collect these throughout the day. So this is before the stress, during the stress, after, and then the recovery. So you can see this ACC28 variety bounces right back following the stress, whereas ACC50 is a little slow to recover and R500 is really hit pretty hard. So it doesn't really recover immediately following that stress. This is also seen with this leaf number, so tracking growth after the stress, um, where ACC28 is doing really well, R500 is, is not, and ACC50 is in the middle. And this is consistent with some other metrics we look at as well. So clearly ACC28 is our more tolerant, followed by ACC50 and R500. So now that we've kind of classified their tolerances, let's look at the transcriptome data again. And do we see certain signatures or expression patterns that are unique to this ACC28? So this is work done by a graduate student in the lab, Angela Ricono, and a former undergrad, Eileen Casolo. So they took those three accessions, those data sets that I described, and ran them through DIPOM to ask how many genes are changing in expression pattern in response to cold. And what they found was between 12 to 16,000 genes are changing. So remember, this is capturing that full 24 hour period. So we really see a large rewiring of this transcriptional network in response to cold. Now, if we look at some of those clusters, um, here are the top two clusters for each accession covering about seven to 900 genes. You can see these responses are very time of day dependent. And this is consistent with what Stacy was telling us earlier about that gating of cold. So these genes are responding at certain times of day. So in the control is in the red and the blue is the cold. And you can see that that phase or that peak of expression is shifting in response to cold. 
So we wondered if we took all those genes that were changing and just looked globally at their phase change. So the difference in the timing of expression between warm and cold, do we see anything that's unique to um, any of these genotypes? So when we do that again, when we calculate that phase difference here, are the distributions, so the arrows indicating zero phase change, and then every bar is a two hour change. And what I hope you can see immediately is that ACC28, our more tolerant line really jumps out where there are a lot more genes that are showing a phase delay of two to six hours in response to cold compared to ACC50 and R500 that are more normally distributed. And so this is something that is really interesting. And of course, there are many different phases within this. So genes that are expressed at different times of day. So Angie has now uh, generated gene regulatory networks for these. And we're now trying to identify the transcription factors that are driving some of these patterns that are unique to ACC28. So stay tuned for that. But in the last few minutes, um, I want to get back to the question about those paralogs. So remember in the circadian data set, we saw about 40% of the genes in multi-copy had divergent expression. And so we want to know if they're also diverging in responsiveness to cold stress. So we went back to those um, paralogs in our three data sets here. And just under control conditions, we asked, do we see something similar where these genes in multiple copies are changing an expression pattern? And now we see upwards of 60% of those paralogs have different expression patterns, suggesting again, that there's a different regulation on these genes. So now if we look at their cold stress responsiveness, do we see evidence of divergence? So if we take our paralog pairs and we ask, is it more likely that one responds to cold or both in these, in these different uh, accessions? And what we find is for all three accessions, we see significant enrichment where one of the paralog is responding to cold and not both, which is consistent with the divergence in expression, at least in terms of their responsiveness to cold stress. So this is something that we're really interested in following up on um, and testing some of these out to see if they are in fact um, conferring stress tolerance. Now, what was probably most surprising to us is when we took those paralogs that are responding to cold and we compared them, the overlap was very low. So the vast majority of these cold responsive paralogs are unique to each genotype. And this is within one crop type of brassica, which is still quite surprising. And we're seeing this when we compare across the different morphotypes as well. So this is suggesting that there has been a lot of change in the regulation of these genes, even at the genotype level. So just to summarize what I've told you today, uh, following that duplication in Brassica rapa, we see there's been an expansion of the circadian network. And this has really also led to diversification of paralog expression patterns. And this just would not have been captured had we not taken that kind of time course approach to analyze these gene expression profiles. In response to cold, we see large scale rewiring of the network with very time of day specific changes in expression, leading to certain biological processes that are being altered at certain times of day. And then we also see a lot of interspecific variation in Brassica rapa for their, which genes are responding to stress. And this, while it makes it challenging for identifying targets for crop improvement, we think this is a really great opportunity to explore regulatory elements that might be changing these, that are driving these responses. And so that's something we're hoping to pull out of our, our networks. So with that, um, I think I've thanked everyone in the lab who's done this work. I want to, of course, thank collaborators on this project, funding, especially NSF and JGI in the University of Minnesota. And I am happy to take any questions. So, sorry, Kathleen, my internet okay. uh, fell for a second. <laughs> okay, huh? I'll ask you a couple of questions. Um, so the first one is, uh, you say that 42% of genes, uh, they saw this divergence in expression. And have you look, uh, do you have some idea of how is that, uh, how is that mediated? Is that difference on cis elements or, or is that this expansion of, uh, clock transcription factors that is causing this? Do you have an idea? Yeah, it's a good question. So in the in our eLife paper, what we also did is, so we asked whether those expression profiles um, have diverged. So if one of them was more like a Arabidopsis, so we built gene regulatory networks and compared it to Arabidopsis. And we're able to identify, mm -hmm. you know, one copy that we had more 
uh, that was more similar to the Arabidopsis based on expression pattern. Now, if we build those same networks, but instead of expression, we use cis, um, conserved non-coding sequences. So these are predicted to have the regulatory elements. We found the same thing. So the presence of those CNSs in the upstream region of the gene were predictive of those expression patterns. So we do think this is regulatory elements. We didn't see any evidence that it's based on amino acid changes among any of these transcription factors. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so the other question is, um, So um, I'm sorry, I had the problems with the internet, but I think now uh, we can go to the third speaker now. Uh, thank you very much, Katli, for thank you. The talk. Um, so the next speaker now is uh, is Glenn Urki. Gleg is uh, an assistant professor in the Department of Biological Science uh, in the University of Alberta in Canada. And his research, his research has focused on understanding how plants are regulated using quantitative proteomics. In particular, his research looks to connect daily post translational signaling events to the corresponding post translational modifications on enzymes that are catalyze, catalyzing these events. And he's also involved in uh, several proteomic communities and proteomic, proteomic initiatives. So, uh, Gleg, if you would like to start your talk, thank you. Okay, great. So, hopefully, everyone can hear me. Uh, we're okay. Okay, excellent. All right. Well, thank you to the organizers of this for having me here to speak today about some of the work we're doing in the lab. Um, and yeah, so today I'll be talking about uh, taking a different approach, looking at using proteomics to understand the circadian clock, and with that, uh, just a brief introduction, I think everyone kind of knows is that the clock is comprised of a number of uh, transcription factors that precisely regulate uh, the time of day. And in Arabidopsis, uh, the clock controls a wide swath of the uh, gene expressions, and that this corresponds to a number of different uh, biological processes, uh, demonstrating the importance of the clock and also uh, from a number of the previous uh, uh, speakers here uh, showing that uh, it's important in regulating also abiotic stress. Um, but what we mostly know about the clock today is derived from transcriptional regulation uh, studies and uh, genetics work, which has been fantastic, but we really lack an understanding of what's going on at the protein level, with proteins obviously being very important to understanding um, connections to biological processes and changes in metabolites. And so my group is most interested in using quantitative proteomics and PTMomics to answer a variety of questions. And so do we see changes in the proteome on a daily basis? Uh, to what extent do we see these changes? And then also, how does this correlate with our current understanding of transcriptional changes over the course of a day? As well, we like to ask questions related to post-translational modifications, particular protein phosphorylation, though other uh, post-translational modifications are also very important. And, uh, and then we want to understand what is going on with regards to the PTM machinery and also what kind of substrates that PTM machinery is uh, regulating. And so uh, I've been involved in a number of uh, proteomic projects over the years, looking at answering this question uh, from a diel perspective. And from that, I'm just gonna quickly summarize work from my group and also some other groups um, that have given us some nice insights uh, of a proteome uh, understanding of diel biology uh, in Arabidopsis at least. And so what we found is that the clock is pretty modular and in particular, it controls each of these clock elements. If you knock them out, control a number of transcription factors and protein kinases in terms of changing in abundance. We also know, and there's a number of possible reasons for this, that uh, diel transcript changes don't seem to uh, equate to protein level changes and PTM level changes. And that's perhaps not surprising. It's very temporally regulated and uh, you, there's, there's a number of reasons why this could be also some technical ones as well. 
And we also know that PTMs are likely key regulators of daily plant cell processes. This creates a lot of complexity because uh, it's not so easy uh, to assess some of these and how those um, PTMs change from a value perspective relative to transcriptional or protein abundance changes uh, is very challenging to track. And so together, these uh, studies kind of allow us to form a framework, a protein-centric framework of what we understand about the circadian clock and diel biology, starting with uh, the clock itself being regulated by PTMs. There's uh, a lot of nice work by a number of groups, the News Now group, the Summers group, that have characterized uh, some of these intersections, amongst others. And then we know that ultimately the clock itself regulates a number of uh, 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 transcriptional expression of a number of modifiers, so transcription factors and protein kinases, amongst other PTM regulators, which likely uh, drive its uh, uh, extensive regulation of plant cell processes. And then ultimately the regulation of these key regulators through PTMs uh, convey a number of uh, regulatory changes that could occur uh, at the biological level. However, working with plants is very complex. The samples themselves are high dynamic range, highly complex samples. And so from a proteomics perspective, this creates a lot of challenges. So my group has endeavored to try and create more uh, accessible and more reliable um, proteomics uh, acquisition technologies to, uh, to go ahead and quantify changes uh, in protein levels in plants. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So conventionally, and through all the data I just showed you, uh, data-dependent acquisition or shotgun proteomics has been how that data was acquired. And what we know from uh, employing data-dependent uh, acquisition is that it uses a top-end approach and not to get too uh, down into the weeds about proteomics. It basically makes decisions about what peptides get sequenced. Um, ultimately, uh, this leads to a bias towards more abundant proteins. Uh, even with technical replicates uh, injections, you can have bias and ultimately leading to missing values that, that uh, create uh, gaps in your data matrix for assessing biological uh, questions. So more recently, uh, different approaches have come up, data independent acquisition, um, where all the peptides get fragmented and you collect uh, as much of the MS2 information as you can to quantify changes in these uh, uh, peptides from a spectral centric uh, perspective. Um, this was in, uh, hampered a bit in terms of its uh, utility to maybe the plant world due to the requirement for creating spectral libraries, but there's been a lot of advancements in, in the space allowing now for library free analyses and a number of tools, both um, commercially per, um, developed as well as freely accessible ones uh, that now allow for library free uh, acquisition, which makes, which makes it much more accessible to plant science. And then where my group comes in really is uh, advancing how we can get deeper into the proteome to get better resolution. And so we were inspired by uh, a, a paper published in 2018 called the Box, creating a technology called Boxcard DDA, where you would segment your MS1 to create smaller packets of, of peptides for fragmentation that ultimately get uh, assessed at the MS2 level uh, through uh, sequential window acquisitions. And what we find by doing this uh, is that we actually get quite a bit better resolution of the plant proteome, which I'll show you now. So to do this work and to benchmark our Boxcard DDA proteomics acquisition uh, approach, we use light and dark grown Arabidopsis cell culture, fairly simplistic system, but one that has quite a few differences between the two. And we compared uh, data dependent acquisition, standard workflow to uh, direct DIA, which is a library free DIA acquisition approach. And we already saw quite a substantial number of proteins that we could quantify. We saw almost a 34% increase. And then we compared our box card DIA acquisition to our direct DIA acquisition and got an additional 8%, which roughly equates to about 40% increase, in, increase in quantified proteins across four or four biological replicates. So this is quite uh, exciting for us and, and provides a lot of opportunities for deeper acquisition or deeper understanding of the plant proteome. So then we wanted to look under the hood to see where some of these uh, benefits were coming from. Um, and so when you just compare direct, uh, sorry, direct DIA to data dependent acquisition, you can quickly see that lower abundant uh, proteins are almost non-existent in the ability of, uh, in the data dependent acquisition. Here you see some numbers on the side where we're completely uh, missing um, lower abundant uh, proteins, whereas direct DIA uh, or data independent acquisition was much better at getting a more even distribution uh, and quantifying proteins of lower abundance. And these would be things like transcription factors and protein kinases, which are ultimately uh, most interesting to a lot of people um, in the plant world. And then when you apply boxcard DA, we got even better distribution of these uh, 
ability to quantify both high and low abundant proteins um, relative to direct DIA, um, giving us some indications that in fact we are making further improvements. And you'll see a little bit more about why that might be. So I would, uh, I can safely say that data independent acquisition is much better at uh, quantifying lower abundant proteins. So we go even further and we assess where we're getting uh, the benefits of boxcar DA in terms of missing values and, and uh, quantified groups. And what you can start to see uh, emerges quite a, a striking picture is that in terms of replicates, where we're seeing proteins being quantified, data dependent acquisition was very poor at uh, acquiring across replicates. In fact, 25% of those were only identified and quantified in one uh, replicate. And you can see that that corresponds in that one replicate to those low abundant proteins that we are very uh, poorly quantifying, as I showed you in the previous slide. However, when you move to direct DIA, you can start to see some improvements where, you know, there's a few things that could be present uh, or being quantified in three or four replicates, but most were in four or four replicates. And then when you move to the uh, boxcar approach, we're seeing uh, complete uh, um, quantification of the data matrix, or, or sorry, a, a generation of a complete data matrix by quantifying across four or four replicates, which allows us to make more uh, robust biological insights. And so when you start to look at this from a biological perspective, we plotted the normalized abundance of proteins, of a proteins in our samples, and we looked at uh, proteins that correspond to different groups, so things like glycolysis, which typically would be high abundant, to things like uh, transcription factors and protein phosphorylation, which are typically low abundant. And you can start to see where we're getting improvements. Now we do see a little bit of a drop off at the high abundant protein level when you start to use direct DIA, but I think it's a fair trade off because of the massive increases we're getting in quantifying low abundant proteins. And so you can see here quite uh, clearly that we're getting improvements in things like detecting transcription factors and uh, things related to protein phosphorylation like protein kinases. And then again, when you go to the boxcar DA approach, we're getting even further improvement relative to direct DA with a small decrease again in the higher abundant proteins. And so in the end, we've started to use this approach to ask questions in diobiology. Um, and in particular, what led to me speaking to you today and something we published in plant physiology was starting to uh, assess the clock uh, using boxcar DA. And we did this using um, examining the Reveille triple mutant, which was provided to us by uh, Stacey Harmer, very nice, uh, very kindly. And we wanted to start to examine how proteome changes uh, could be affecting um, or, or were resulting from knocking out uh, the, the Reveille genes 4, 6, and 8. We were able to very easily replicate exactly what was seen previously um, by the Harmer lab, which is uh, fantastic to see, and in terms of fresh weight and dry weight, as well as plant area. And these are all very much important um, traits from an agronomic perspective for things like leafy green uh, production of produce. And so we wanted to understand a little bit more about what could be going on at the protein level um, uh, that's resulting in these changes. And so we did quantitative proteomics. We looked at ZT0 and ZT12, or roughly ZT0 and ZT12, so ZT23 and ZT11, let's say. And um, what we were able to resolve was a network of proteins. This is a string database association network, which uses prior knowledge to make connections between um, nodes, in this case, proteins that we see changing in abundance at either ZT0 or ZT12 um, in the wild type versus the mutant. And what you could see is two categories that jumped out to us, which was starch metabolism and the proteasome. Um, I do a lot of these sort of networks and the proteasome is not one that often comes up. So we thought that was particularly interesting. And to see such a large uh, network of starch metabolism enzymes was also quite uh, interesting. And so we followed this up with some validation to look at this. We did initially some low resolution iodine, starch iodine staining for starch. And you can see uh, uh, a difference in terms of the uh, abundance of starch that's uh, present at the ZT0 time point. Then we further resolved um, this uh, time point to look at the starch amount using enzymatic uh, assays, and we could see a very clear uh, starch excess that was occurring at that ZT0 time point, which also corresponds to a number of uh, protein level changes that we observed in our network. In particular, the wild type had more uh, uh, starch, uh, a higher abundance of starch uh, degradation enzymes at ZT0 than RVE did, so likely um, a reduction in the ability of starch uh, degradation to occur at that ZT0 time point. 
We also wanted to assess a little bit more of the proteasome activity. This is also very interesting for, for a number of reasons and that it, it might connect to some of the reasons why we don't see mRNA paralleling protein level changes. Um, and ultimately we did some seedlings uh, plated out on plates containing the proteasome inhibitor MIG-132 uh, versus those that have MIG-132. And you can see that there is a difference in growth uh, with the RV468 mutant being deficient in, in growth relative to the Columbia well type. And again, we followed this up by some enzymatic activities and actually saw that the RVE468 mutant was deficient um, in proteasome activity, which again corresponds to the proteome data that we had seen previously. It's quite interesting that this is uh, this, this uh, phenotype that we are, uh, sorry, this um, effect that we're seeing here is that the RVE68 mutant has larger cell size. And that actually corresponds to the phenotype that's observed in a lot of the mutant plants that are deficient in proteasome. So we were making some nice connections to previously observed uh, uh, phenotypic data. And so just to summarize, uh, we're really just scratching the surface, uh, myself and some other groups around the world um, that are doing the di yield protein level regulation uh, from a protein perspective. And it's really important that we pursue this to get a more holistic understanding of how um, diel di biology works in plants. Um, and we're trying to develop better tools to do this. Um, mass spectrometry has been uh, advancing quite a lot in recent times, and we think this is a very exciting time to be involved. And we can, we've shown very clear that we can get better resolution of the proteome, and that we can uh, use proteomics to create actionable data for, uh, for, for further addressing biological questions. And so with that, I'd like to thank the group. Um, in particular, two postdocs in the group that were central to this work, all the funding agencies that have supported uh, this work to varying degrees. And with that, I will take some questions. So thank you. Um, uh, thank you very much uh, for your talk. Um, um, the first question uh, will be about the, the, prot the proteasome activity. You see that it uh, it's always is lower in the you know, in the CT0 and the CT12, is it known why is that, is that happening? Is there, is Reveille, uh, the Reveille is involved in regulating the transcription of the proteasome subunits or, or what, how do you think that's? Uh, so that's something that we're, happening? we're actively pursuing to follow up. So I would say stay tuned for that. But that's a really good question. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And the other thing is like, if you compare the phenotypes of, uh, of the revelies on on the starch, for example, how does it compare to other clock mutants? Uh, this um, this difference on the starch accumulation during the day. It's a fairly subtle phenotype, to be fair. Um, and you, you know, we just happen to observe it at ZT zero, and I would say that other clock uh, mutants have more pervasive starch excess phenotypes than the one that we observed with Reveille. So, do you think that those uh, this starch phenotype is because uh, the regulation of Reveille on other clock components. Or, oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, whether or not it's a direct regulatory effect uh, versus through the clock itself is something that we haven't resolved. Okay, thank you. And uh, there is a question in the chat that says whether your team has a website for checking these uh, deal changes in um, protein levels, or if you have. Uh, made a website to share this um, this data that that you have made. Of yes, release and of. Good point. So uh, we are working with uh, Nicholas Provert at the University of Toronto to put the data into their ePlant uh, platform. So that should be I, hopefully shortly, maybe Decemberish. Let's say, yeah. So all the the data we have, we're trying to compile and put it into that uh, in a form that's easily searchable for plant biologists to search their favorite uh, genes. That's, that's great. Thank you very much. Um, and you. I pass it back to Mary, I think. Yes. Yes. Um, thank you, Glenn. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you, Lee. Uh, thank you, Ava. And thank you, Stacy. Thank you, attendees. And I just want to make a note that October 18th, we will have part two of the Circadian Rhythms Focus Issue Celebration with three additional speakers. So thank you, everyone, uh, for your time and um, wonderful talks. We look forward to seeing you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.